a special warm welcome to Phil Fabre, and I'll we'll have Phil introduced in a few minutes more formally. Uh, this will be our third Zoom meeting, and our uh, regular evening is going to be the third Wednesday of every month that keeps us well away from New South Wales, first Wednesday, and Queensland, the last Friday. So you should have at least have three meetings a month with the three organizations. Um, just on the next meeting, uh, our next meeting, our guest speaker will be uh, Derek Buckmaster, who is here tonight. Welcome, Derek. And he will take us back to 1936 with a presentation about the railway and the newspaper wars. Um, details will be circulated shortly via email. And thanks for that, Derek. I will now hand over to Dave Plosser, our president, and he will introduce our guest speaker more formally. Over to you, Dave. Well, I have, you have to unmute you now. Look, I'll, uh, I'll need to unmute you, Dave. Can you unmute yourself? I'll do it. Thanks. How's that? Yeah, here you go. <laughs> uh, thanks, Robert, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Roger McDonald, I can see as well. Um, tonight, we're very pleased to have uh, our uh, member and also Vice President of the Civil Aviation Historical Society, Mr. Phil Vabre. Uh, Phil has been long connected with uh, ATC and um, also the museum at Essendon Airport. And uh, in more recent times, uh, Phil has become fairly well known in relation to uh, writing a book on the, uh, the Empire of Flying Boats and their bases, uh, stemming all the way from England to Australia. And um, it's an interesting sort of aspect there that um, Phil thought he would have the book uh, put together in about a year's time. And the more he uh, got into it, the more he found there were like um, little side um, stories going on. And of course, that's uh, stemmed uh, to the tonight's talk on the Empire Air Mail Scheme in operation from 1938 to 1939. The war, of course, sort of a, um, a different aspect of that entirely. So without much uh, further ado, I'll just hand back to, uh, to Robert to commence uh, a brief introduction further on, on our friend uh, Phil Vabre, and then, as I say, on with the show. Robert, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Dave. And I'm now handing over to you, Phil. You have to unmute yourself, and the screen is all yours. Thanks very much, Dave and uh, Robert. I'll just see if I can get this going. <laughs> Hang on, Hang on. I forgot to push the share screen button first. Uh, that one. Okay. Thank you. There we go. Can we see it? All good. Excellent. Rightio. Well, as I said, thanks very much, uh, Robert and Dave, for uh, those words of introduction, and thank you, everybody, for coming along tonight. Um, feel like I've been banging on a fair bit about uh, Empire Flying Boats lately. Um, so I hope everybody's not too bored with it. Um, as Dave uh, mentioned, uh, I started off back in 2012, I think it was, to uh, work on this uh, book. And um, I thought this is going to be a two year project. And uh, eight years later, I'm still going. And as Dave said, uh, the more I started digging, the more I found little rabbit holes to go down. And it's ab absolutely a fascinating uh, period and a fascinating story. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you about tonight, well, I guess most of you are probably aware of the Empire Airmail Scheme, or at least of the flying boats that Qantas operated as part of that uh, scheme, even if only in a, a sort of a broad outline point of view. So. What I'm hoping to do tonight is to talk a bit more about the detail of the operation of the Empire Airmail Scheme, what it was about, how it worked, some of the places that uh, were involved, and maybe uh, talk about a few things that you don't know about the scheme, um, some of the interesting aspects of it. 
Um, you can see from the uh, this title slide here, uh, a couple of years ago in 2018, we had an exhibition at the Airways Museum on the for the 80th anniversary of the scheme with a lot of um, uh, period photographs and, and so on. So some of those images I'll be uh, using again in this uh, presentation. Unfortunately, we've, we've taken that exhibition down so you can't see it now, even if you could get to the museum. Um, but uh, one of these days, they'll appear in my book. Okay, so let's uh, start off with uh, what actually was the Empire Airmail Scheme. So in 1934, the scheme was conceived by um, the chairman or the then chairman of Imperial Airways. Uh, and it was actually a very, very um, far reaching concept that he came up with. The problem was that Imperial Airways at that time were operating um, pretty much a hodgepodge fleet of aeroplanes uh, they had two of those and three of something else and four of something else. Um, and uh, they're all old biplanes, very slow. And they needed to really um, find a way to modernise their fleet and uh, to get into much bigger and uh, faster, more modern aeroplanes. The idea that uh, they came up with was to carry all first class mail throughout the British Empire by air with no surcharge. So in most places at that time for air mail, you had to pay a surcharge. In other words, an extra charge on top of the normal postage for a letter. Um, and the idea of the Empire Air Mail scheme was to do away with those surcharges altogether. Um, the uh, first class mail for, for the younger ones among us, which just means uh, letter mail basically. So not packages. So the idea of, of doing that was that the substantial reduction in the price of sending a letter around the empire would encourage people to send more mail and the increased mail loads would pay for the service to increase, uh, uh, oh, sorry, to, to uh, fund the construction of larger, faster and more modern aircraft and make it economical to operate those uh, larger aircraft. And for various reasons, which I won't uh, go into tonight because we don't have time, but uh, they decided that flying boats were, were the way to go. So consequently, Imperial Airways contracted with Short Brothers uh, of Rochester in the UK to build 28 uh, of their S23 flying boats, known as the Empire Flying Boat. And for their day, they were I like the A380 of the, of the late 1930s. They so were the biggest, most modern, most technologically advanced aeroplanes um, in existence, or at least certainly in, in uh, Britain. Um, they were even arguably in some cases more modern and more advanced than um, the latest that America had to offer, probably the, the DC-3 being the, the premier product coming out of America at that time. Um, so this cutaway shows you the sort of general uh, layout of the Empire flying boat. So the uh, Imperial Airways took a big gamble actually. They contracted for Shorts to build 28 of these aeroplanes um, off the drawing board. So before a, an aircraft had even flown or a prototype had even flown. Um, now, previously, as I said, Imperial Airways had had a fleet that was four and six and two and that sort of, of aircraft. So 28 was really a, a huge fleet of aeroplanes uh, back in the late 1930s. So looking in a bit more detail at some of the features of the Empire Flying Boat, if we zoom in on the upper deck, so it was a two deck aeroplane. Um, and the upper deck at the front, we had the control cabin where we had a crew of a pilot or captain and first officer as they were called in uh, nautical uh, terms. Um, this bulkhead here didn't actually exist. There was no bulkhead. Behind the captain sat the radio officer, so you had a, a dedicated uh, man for communications, bearing, oops, that didn't work too well, did it? Bearing in mind that um, uh, in those days, communication was by Morse code, principally. Uh, further down the uh, control deck, as it was called at the back, was the storage for the mail. So on the port side of the aeroplane, there was a like a cage uh, where they stowed all the mail sacks. And in the early uh, part of the 
the service, they had a, um, a chap called the flight clerk and his job was to do all the paperwork on, on the flight. So later he was called the purser, but originally he was the flight clerk. Uh, he had a typewriter and he had to type up manifests and so on. So the aircraft would generally do probably four sectors a day and at each stopping point, they had to have about 20 different bits of paper to hand over for customs and immigration and so on and so forth. It was his job to type all of that up as the aeroplane was flying along and also to manage uh, the cargo or the mail particularly, make sure that all the correct bags were unloaded and offloaded. So later on, uh, the purser, when they, the mail loads actually turned out to be a lot bigger than were originally thought. And uh, they actually did away with the front passenger cabin and turned that into further mail stowage and the, the purser moved down to their, their next little office downstairs. <clears throat> so we talked about passenger cabins. Initially, there were four passenger cabins, later reduced to three. Uh, there was a centre section cabin known as the spar cabin, which was obviously under the, the wing spars. Behind that was a cabin called the promenade cabin, and that was called the promenade cabin because, as you can see here, we've got this chap standing up, uh, leaning on a rail. The windows in that cabin on the left-hand side, or the port side of the aeroplane, were actually set higher than necessary to look at uh, or to look out of if you were sitting in a chair. So they were designed to be looked out of standing up. And the idea was that people could get out of their seat and they would be able to walk up and down that section of cabin or lean against the rail as that bloke's doing and look out the window and watch the world passing by. And of course, the aeroplanes flew a lot lower than aeroplanes that we're used to today. So you could actually see the scenery as it went past. And you'll also notice these chairs that the passengers sitting in, as passengers are sitting in, they were designed by a, a well-known um, company in the UK called Rumbolds, uh, made out of um, aluminium uh, alloy frame and then very well upholstered. And they were regarded as being top-notch for comfort. They were not quite fully reclining, but they, they reclined quite a long way so that you could uh, sort of snooze comfortably in the aeroplane. Uh, they were quite large, well padded and so on. And actually the seat cushions doubled as life preservers. Um, the other thing you'll notice up here in the spa cabin, we've got this person sitting in a bunk reading a book. Now the Empire flying boats were designed to have bunks. The idea was that um, they would operate night services where people could uh, sleep their way to the next uh, port. Uh, and you'll often see photographs of Empire cabins with bunks, but they were in fact never used operationally. Um, all the photographs you see are publicity photographs, usually taken in the mock-up at uh, Shorts. Um, the reason they were never used operationally, two things. Firstly, they found that uh, in flight, the aeroplane hull flexed uh, so much that they couldn't actually fit the bunks properly. Uh, so it was one problem. But the main problem was that the state of the uh, alighting facilities, in other words, the landing and takeoff areas, and the uh, navigational facilities on the routes in the late 1930s just weren't up to night flying or safe year round night flying. So they did operate the flying boats at night, uh, particularly if they had to make up time, they would uh, fly into the night sometimes and they would often start before dawn on the days flying but they never scheduled uh, night operations and therefore never had any need for the bunks. There was always a plan to go to night operations um, at some time, but um, the facilities just didn't um, come along in time for this uh, during the lifetime of the uh, Empire flying boats. The other thing that they had, uh, which was a bit of an innovation, was, or at least it was for Qantas when they operated the Empire flying boats down under, underneath the control deck. Um, we had uh, on the port side lavatories for uh, ladies and gentlemen, separate lavatories. And on the starboard side, we had a galley with a steward. And the steward's job obviously was to keep the passengers happy. Uh, now there were no, contrary to popular belief, there were no actual heating or cooking facilities on the aircraft. 
all the hot food came aboard in um, insulated hot boxes at each port, and then the steward would dial it out in flight, it would obviously stay warm. And similarly, um, hot water for heating, uh, sorry, for um, drinking tea, coffee, and so on, um, had to come a, come aboard in thermos flasks. So uh, as I said, no no uh, heating or cooking facilities on the on the aeroplane. So this is just a photograph of the uh, control deck. This is uh, Ashley Gay. He was a Qantas captain, and uh, he's I don't know what he's doing the crossword or something um, as they're tooling along. Now you'll notice in the uh, centre binnacle here um, there was an autopilot. So this was the uh, first aircraft well, when Qantas got its Empire flying boats. It was the first aircraft to uh, enter service in Australia that was fitted with an autopilot. So uh, preceded ANA's uh, DC-2s. Um, so quite a comprehensive uh, set of instruments. The uh, uh, first officer had mostly the engine instruments, captain had the, uh, the flying instruments. Behind the captain, as I said, was the uh, radio officer's position. So he faced backwards at his uh, radio set. And uh, these, when Qantas uh, started operating the Empire flying boats, these were the first radio officers that Qantas employed as well. And there's the steward in his pantry. This is a chap called um, uh, Drury. I've forgotten his first name off the top of my head. Uh, it was William Drury. And he was Qantas's first steward, in fact, and later became uh, what they called the Providor, which was kind of a catering manager for their uh, operations. Um, so you can see he's got his uh, plate racks and uh, plenty of booze. Uh, you had to pay for booze though on the, on the uh, aircraft. And here's a photograph of the, uh, the cabin. This is from a um, cigarette card actually. Uh, and you can see these uh, big uh, rumble chairs. They had a little table that you could put down. Now, <clears throat> when you think uh, that the trip from Sydney to Southampton in the UK took nine and a half days. I think you can understand why you'd probably want a pretty comfortable seat because um, you're spending a lot of time in it. Talked about the promenade cabin and this is a photograph of it. This is actually the, the mock-up and um, shorts. Uh, there's the, the rail down the port side with the higher windows on that side. So you had a bit of space here. I didn't actually mention it, but normally these aircraft were fitted with 17 passenger seats. Uh, and then uh, here's the central passageway that goes through into the spa cabin. And then forward of that was the toilets and the galley. And then right at the front, there is the, um, the bow cabin, uh, which was later turned into mail storage, as I mentioned. So we think about the Empire flying boats today as being these uh, super luxurious aircraft um, passengers being the well heeled and uh, so on and having a luxurious trip uh, halfway across the world and of course that's true but that is not at all what these flying boats were for. There's a, there's a misconception that we have today that, that that was their purpose. Their main purpose was not at all carrying passengers. Passengers were the cream on top of the uh, cake for Qantas and Imperial Airways. Um, and th this was their advertising when they played up that idea of uh, luxury travel because of course they wanted to attract these well-paying passengers. Um, this is Rose Bay Flying Boat Base. You can see there's a publicity shot, but these well-dressed uh, people with their, their luggage with the Qantas uh, stickers on them um, waiting to uh, board the flying boat. And you can see in this uh, um, cover of Empire Airways, which is the Qantas House Journal, the, uh, the famous uh, signpost that they had uh, all along the route, in fact. Um, but this is the one in uh, Rose Bay. So it gives you the uh, destinations you can go to and how many miles they were away. So it was all, as I said, their publicity played up this idea of luxury transport, but that really wasn't uh, what it was about. The real purpose of the whole operation was carrying the mail. And the the um, governments of Britain and uh, Australia put in a lot of money 
into uh, subsidising the service. Um, and the whole purpose of it was to shift mail around the empire, uh, to improve empire communications, to improve the commercial activities of uh, the British, um, or the countries in the British empire. So these chaps here, they're bringing the mail ashore at uh, Rose Bay. So the Empire Email Scheme uh, came in three stages. And this is a brochure from the, the late 30s that, that quite well illustrates those three stages. The first stage uh, was the um, or bringing Africa and the African colonies into the scheme. The second stage extended that out to uh, India and Malaya and also Burma, for that matter. And then stage three was the bit that really uh, concerned us here in Australia, was obviously the extension of the scheme to Australia and New Zealand. And now, New Zealand joined in the Empire Email Scheme at the same time as Australia did in 1938, in August 1938, but the air link to New Zealand, for various reasons, didn't actually get going till Teal started operating their empire boats in 1940. So the mail to and from New Zealand uh, or came to Sydney or went from Sydney by air, uh, but it went to and from New Zealand by ship until 1940. And uh, by 1940, the scheme had actually finished, which I'll cover in the end. Um, so that's the broad outline of the scheme. How it actually it was implemented um, in a bit more detail. Uh, as the Empire flying boats started to come online in 1936, uh, the first part of the route that they were used to fill in was on the Mediterranean between Brindisi and Alexandria. Now you might think what a funny place to start operating your, your flying boats, but obviously across the Mediterranean Ocean, you can, whatever it is, Mediterranean Sea, you can understand there's a lot of water there. so flying boats make sense. But the, the other aspect behind the scenes for that, that a lot of people don't know about these days is that prior to this period, Imperial Airways, or, or I should say the British government, had not been able to get uh, overflight rights for Italy um, for reasons which I won't uh, go into. So that meant that anyone traveling between Britain and the Middle East or the Far East or Australia uh, by air, they flew to Paris on Imperial Airways and then they got on the train in Paris and they took the train down to Brindisi in the, the heel of Italy. Um, so they traveled all down through France and across Italy <coughs> by train. And then from Brindisi, they got back on uh, an aircraft and uh, initially Imperial Airways operated short S-17 Kent flying boats across the um, Mediterranean and then once they got to Alexandria in Egypt they would then get back onto a land plane to go either down to um, South Africa or out to the east. Now <coughs> the operation of these flying boats on the Mediterranean I think probably gave Imperial Airways a bit of a rosy view of flying boat operations. So they were in a fairly civilized part of the world with good facilities and the weather in the Mediterranean's usually pretty reasonable. So the flying boats actually made a lot of sense there. And of course they had the problem, engines weren't as reliable as they were later on. So if they had an engine failure, you could land the flying boat in the sea in an emergency, which was a big factor. What they didn't really appreciate, I think, is that there was going to be a huge difference in between operating flying boats on a short route over the Mediterranean <coughs> and trying to operate them um, all the way down to South Africa and all the way out to New Zealand through parts of the world that had virtually no infrastructure in a lot of it um, and a lot worse weather than the Mediterranean. And there's a Turned out the flying boats probably weren't such a great uh, plan. But anyway, uh, that's what they were doing. 
So as more flying boats came online, um, by this stage, uh, Britain had managed to get overflight rights um, from Italy because Italy wanted air access to its colonies in East Africa. And they had to overfly British territory for that. So they, the British leveraged uh, that access against uh, allowing the flying boats to fly uh, over Italy. So the next part of the route to be filled in was back backwards from the Mediterranean to the UK. And that happened in February 1937. So this is prior to the, um, the actual Empire ML scheme itself. <coughs> so we've got to make a distinction between the use of the flying boats and the actual Empire Airmail scheme, which was tied up with the price of sending mail. Um, so this is a picture of uh, flying boats at Southampton. The um, Imperial Airways termi terminus was at 108 Dock, Southampton. And here they are tied up with the, uh, the steamers that uh, formerly had connected Britain with the rest of the world. Uh, and you can see uh, we have um, Calypso, which is a British registered aeroplane, and Carayo here, which is an Australian registered aeroplane, VHAB Dean. This is one of the Qantas owned flying boats. And um, this illustrates the point that the flying boats operated all the way from the UK to Australia and back again. Whereas the Qantas crews, when, when they came in a bit later, Qantas crews only operated the airplanes as far as Singapore. And then an Imperial Airways crew took over the airplane uh, and flew it to uh, the UK and back again, and then handed it back to a Qantas crew. And likewise, so they, they could have British registered airplanes in Australia as well. Now that created its own set of problems, and that's a topic for another talk, which I'm happy to do, but, um, uh, it's an interesting aspect of this game. So the first uh, stage of the Empire ML scheme, stage one, kicked in in July 1937 when the flying boats extended from Alexandria down to uh, Durban in South Africa. And here's a photograph uh, once again at Southampton. This is uh, Circe and some of you will know that Circe has a particular uh, relevance for me. Um, and in the background here is a steamer, the Cape Town Castle, which was uh, employed on the run to South Africa. So the steamer would take about uh, two, two and a half weeks, I think. No, sorry, uh, four weeks to get to um, South Africa. And the flying boat uh, would do it in about two weeks. So you're no, sort of halving the travel time. <clears throat> um, stage two of the uh, scheme kicked in in uh, December 1937 <clears throat> and the flying boats extended out to India and Malaya between December 37 and February 1938. So the initial uh, phase was from Alexandria to Karachi which was in India in those days and then from Karachi to Calcutta then Calcutta to Rangoon, and then Rangoon down to Singapore. So <clears throat> as more and more flying boats came online, they were able to push the service out, or the flying boat service out, um, bit by bit. Now, <clears throat> in that uh, section of the route, this is one of my uh, favorite photographs. Um, this is uh, Cleo on the Sea of Galilee at Tiberias in Palestine, as it was then. Uh, and you can see in the background, this is Mount Hermon on the uh, Palestine-Lebanon border. So quite a, uh, a photograph when you think about the history of, of the place and so on, and, and just a beautiful image. Now, as part of the introduction of the Empire Airmail scheme and the, the uh, flying boats, um, previously, obviously, uh, they'd been using land planes, so now we had to have uh, water aerodromes. Now, part of the rationale for using the flying boats was that they thought, well, any suitable stretch of water can be a flying boat base. Well, that turned out not really to be true. Um, now, some places along the route built quite magnificent uh, <clears throat> places to operate these aeroplanes from, and this is a photograph of the airport at Basra in uh, southern Iraq at the tip of the um, Arabian Gulf. Now, Basra has been a lot in the news in the last 20 years or so. 
uh, but not for uh, really good reasons. Um, but this is uh, what it was like back in the late 1930s. So this aerodrome was specially uh, constructed about that time. So we had a land aerodrome here on this side and the Chateau Arab River there is where the flying boats operated. And they moored up outside of this uh, beautiful uh, terminal building here, <coughs> which we can see in this photograph. So lovely Art Deco, <coughs> pardon me, Art Deco architecture. So um, we're looking at it from the riverside where the flying boats would have moored. You can see the land aerodrome and the hangars uh, in the background there. So uh, a really quite a lovely uh, building and quite a magnificent uh, thing. So it was a hotel. Um, because there was no night flying, of course, the passengers had to stay somewhere every night. Um, so in a lot of places, it was in top hotels. But where there weren't hotels or um, uh, where there were other facilities, that, or I guess basically where there weren't hotels, um, there were often um, uh, accommodation constructed as part of the, the airport itself. So we don't kind of tend to think about airports having hotels these days, although a lot of them do, but not as part of the hotel, they tend to be separate to, to the actual airport infrastructure. Now, <clears throat> I just want to illustrate one of the other um, oddities of, of this period. The Australian Empire flying boats, or the six that were destined for Qantas, were all delivered around uh, the beginning of 1937. And Qantas wrote to the Department of Civil Aviation wanting to register them. And the Department of Civil Aviation said, well, you're not actually going to start operating them here till towards the end of the year, so go away. Um, and that left them in a bit of a bind. So the airplanes had been delivered from shorts, and this is a, a photograph of Gucci, Alpha Bravo Charlie, or it was an Apple Bob something or other, it would have been back then. Um, Abel Baker Charlie. Abel Baker Charlie, thank you, John. <coughs> Appreciate that. Um, <coughs> this is a photograph taken outside the shorts works uh, pretty soon after the aircraft was first launched, and you can see it was. Uh, shipped out of the factory with its Australian registration painted on it. But the aeroplane wasn't able to be registered in Australia. So Qantas had these flying boats. They'd been delivered to Imperial Airways on their behalf in the UK. Um, what were they going to do? Were they going to sit around for um, you know, six or eight months till Qantas could do something with them? Well, that wasn't very sensible. So Qantas came up with a, uh, a deal to lease them to Imperial Airways. And that would allow Imperial Airways, of course, to start the flying boat services up a bit earlier than they otherwise would have been able to. The problem was that without uh, the aeroplanes not being registered, they couldn't legally fly them. So the Australian flying boats were all re uh, actually registered in the UK initially. Um, <clears throat> and you can see this is a picture of uh, Kuji on the Shad El Arab River at Basra. So taken from that terminal building or, or outside the terminal building that we were looking at. Um, and you can see it's got its uh, UK registration on it. Now, <coughs> um, actually, I, I won't go any further into that story because there's more to it, but um, suffice to say, uh, the Australian boats were re-registered briefly uh, in the UK. Another place that uh, built a magnificent uh, airport to operate these aeroplanes from was Singapore. I invested a lot of money in, uh, in uh, the new airport in Kalang on the south coast of Singapore. It was um, opened in 1937. It was an interesting airport, very much of its time. So we had a land aerodrome here. This circular area it was perfectly circular. Uh, it was all built on reclaimed uh, land, by the way. Uh, we have a terminal building up here, which I've got a photograph of in a moment. And down here, we've got a slipway and the flying boat moorings uh, out here at sea. So the aeroplanes could um, uh, alight and take off out in the harbour and then uh, taxi in and moor off the airport or be brought ashore uh, for maintenance work. And, um, Part of the setup that Imperial Airways and Qantas had was that normally the uh, flying boats slipped a service in Singapore. So in other words, the flying boat would come in on one service, um, 
and the service would continue in another flying boat and the one that came in would stay in Singapore till the next service came through, usually uh, from, for uh, some uh, maintenance. So they would pull it out of the water, give it a looking over, put it back in the water ready for the next service. And when the next service came in, that flying boat would then operate the extension of that service on to the UK. Now, when the scheme opened, I still find this incredible. When the scheme started, or the Australian section of the scheme started, the, there was no slipway east of Kalang where you could pull an Empire flying boat out of the water. So just think about that for a few minutes. I'll have more to say about that in a bit. So this is a photograph of the Kalang aerodrome. Here's the slipway down here. So this is where the flying boat's moored. The land aerodrome side here and that uh, beautiful terminal building. And there it is there in lovely Art Deco architecture. And interestingly, that building still exists, still looks pretty much exactly like that. Um, Kalang Aerodrome was closed in the 1950s because it was too small for modern aircraft. Uh, but the building itself has been preserved and it's one of the few relics of the, um, the Empire Flying Boat uh, or the Empire Air Mail Scheme that still exists. Here's a photograph of Kui, one of the Australian boats being uh, pulled up the slipway at um, Kalang. And you can see uh, on the rear fuselage, uh, we've got the uh, red, white and blue recognition stripes. These were applied by hand under the wing as well. These were applied um, <coughs> in 1940, from 1940 onwards, so uh, after the war had started. So this is a photograph from probably 1940 or 41. So the stage three of the Empire Email Scheme started in uh, the very end of July, beginning of August 1938. <clears throat> and that uh, was the extension from Singapore to Sydney. And also, uh, as far as the airmail side of things, it was concerned the um, inclusion of New Zealand in the scheme as well. Now, <clears throat> one of the interesting uh, aspects of it was that um, the Australian government, there are quite protracted negotiations between Britain and Australia about uh, joining in on the Empire ML scheme. And one of the issues that they were arguing over was uh, the issue of surcharges. Now, <clears throat> Australia had fairly hefty surcharges on airmail, and those surcharges were used to fund the airlines, Qantas, <clears throat> West Australian Airways, um, um, Larkin, MMA and so on, all those early airlines. Um, <clears throat> and they're also used to fund the provision of infrastructure. So aerodromes and later on air radio, uh, navigation aids and so on. <clears throat> so when the Empire Airmail Scheme proposed removing the surcharge for international mail, uh, first of all, that was gonna cost the Australian government a lot of money or remove a lot of income that it was using to prop up aviation. Uh, but secondly, it would have led to the ridiculous situation where it was cheaper to send a letter to London than it was to send a letter to Sydney. Um, so obviously that, that wouldn't uh, fly. So they had uh, quite a lengthy process of negotiating over that. And the compromise that they came up with in the end was that uh, inward smile would have no surcharge because that was obviously up to the country of origin. But outwards mail from Australia retained a surcharge. Um, so it wasn't, uh, it was built into the, the price of sending a, a letter overseas, but it, it did, uh, we did keep a surcharge on Australian mail. Even so, it was still cheaper, a lot cheaper, to send a letter from Australia than it had been uh, prior to the Empire ML scheme commencing. So let's have a look at a few places along the way from Singapore to Australia. So the first uh, stopping place is on Java in uh, what's now Indonesia, but was the Netherlands East Indies. This is the office of WM Colville and Co. They were the Qantas agents. They were also the Burns Philp and Clavenus line agents, as you can see on the, uh, on the sign above the window there. Uh, they were the Qantas agents in uh, Batavia, which was the capital of 
uh, the Netherlands East Indies, now known as Jakarta. So this office was down near the docks at Tenjong Priok. And you can see in the doorway here is one of the Qantas uh, crew members, um, whatever he's doing, some handing in some paperwork or something. Next along uh, eastbound was Surabaya. Surabaya is, uh, was quite a big uh, place, even in the late 1930s, very busy port, as you can see, with all the ships in the background there. Here's our flying boat moored just off the uh, jetty. And this is Lester Brain, <coughs> who was the chief pilot of Qantas at that time, walking in. Uh, this chap here in the suit is a politician, I've forgotten his name. Uh, and these two ladies here, I think are his daughters, and this is his secretary. Um, and they're walking into the passenger terminal. And that's what it looked like a rather a lovely design at Surabaya. You can see these passenger terminals are all very small by our standards today, because when you only had 17 passengers on a flying boat and only six flying boats a week, you didn't need a really big terminal. Now, one aspect that we don't think about very much is the Dutch weren't operating flying boats at all, or not civil flying boats anyway. They, they had a military flying boat base at, um, at Surabaya, but not uh, they didn't operate any civil flying boats. So all of these facilities that were built, like this terminal building that we're looking at here, were all built just for the Qantas flying boat service. Now, <clears throat> obviously, the, the Dutch had to spend a fair bit of money, but the Australian government also tipped in some money to um, build these facilities. And there was a quid pro quo in terms of access because the Dutch wanted to operate their aircraft out from Holland to, <coughs> or from the Netherlands to uh, the Netherlands East Indies. And to do that, they had to fly through and over quite a bit of British territory. And similarly, the British were operating the flying boats from Britain out to Australia, and they had to fly over quite a bit of Dutch territory. So they came to a mutual agreement about um, facilities and access. <coughs> Next uh, stop along the way was uh, Bima. This is one of my favourite uh, Empire flying boat photographs. <coughs> Another one. Um, Bima was just a very little town. It was, well, it's an island, um, <coughs> but it had a quite uh, well protected harbour and uh, it was purely a refuelling stop. So, one of the things we don't uh, think about, we know um, there were a lot of stops on the flying boat route, but we maybe don't think about why that was. The reason that, that was the case was that <coughs> these flying boats, as I've said right at the start, they were, they were designed to carry a lot of mail. That was their primary purpose. <clears throat> they were designed to carry large loads of mail and consequently they had quite a short range. So they needed a refuelling base, a refuelling stop every 500 miles or so. So if you divide the distance, whatever it is, 13,000 miles or something between England and Australia or Sydney and Southampton into 500 mile lots, that makes a lot of stops. <clears throat> and hence why they had to stop in an out-of-the-way place like Beamer. It wasn't because they were taking on passengers or doing anything like that. It was purely so they could top up the tanks. And here we have the shell launch uh, topping up the flying boat. Now, in interestingly, these short flying boats, <clears throat> they had a technical innovation. They had a lot of technical innovations, actually, but one of them was they had a pressure, what we would call today a pressure refuelling system. So most aircraft in those days, in fact, all previous airliners, you had to gravity feed fuel into the fuel tanks here to climb up on top of the wing and put the nozzle in the top of the thing like you were refueling a Cherokee or a Cessna or something. Uh, but these flying boats, you didn't. On the side of the boat, there was a cock. On the, uh, sorry, on the side of the flying boat, there was a, 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 a cock led into the side of the hull. Um, the fueling launch had a pump on it. They would come alongside, connect up to the uh, cock on the side of the boat and use the launcher's pump to pump fuel into the flying boat and up into the tanks. Um, so that was quite a technical innovation for its day. Of course, it's completely standard on airline aircraft today. <clears throat> so I've talked about um, 
the Dutch and uh, access rights and so on. And the Dutch had been trying to uh, get rights to fly out to Australia for quite a long time, for about probably 15 years by this uh, stage. And the Australian and British governments had always rejected it because they didn't want the Dutch competing with uh, their own airlines and you know, they were uh, financially precarious enough as it was. Um, but as part of the deal for allowing the flying boats and to operate through the Netherlands East Indies and for building the facilities, the uh, Australian government had to give in and allow the Dutch airlines rights to come out to Australia. And the airline that uh, did it was KNILM, uh, Royal Dutch Indies Airlines, if you translate it. Um, and here's uh, one of their Lockheed 14s in uh, Sydney, I think. Um, now, these aeroplanes, the Lockheed 14s, are a bit faster than the Empire flying boats and the journey time was a, was a bit less. But um, I think if you had to spend eight or nine days on an aeroplane and you had a choice between an Empire flying boat or a Lockheed 14, I reckon I know which one I'd have gone for. But nevertheless, they were able to uh, compete and they had reasonable loads. Uh, although they weren't really allowed to carry mail out of Australia. That was one of the, the things, uh, the, one of the limitations. Um, they did fly a bit of mail in though, and this is um, uh, an air mail cover from the, uh, the first uh, flight on the 3rd of July, 1938. So we come down through uh, Indonesia or the Netherlands East Indies. Um, we came down, uh, we didn't look at Timor, but um, the flying boat stopped at Kupang in Timor. And then the next step was the stretch across the Timor Sea to Darwin. Now, <clears throat> Darwin, gateway to Australia, but in late 1938, the facilities there were very primitive. And uh, we can see the Empire flying boats here moored out on the harbour. This is the Civil Aviation Control Launch. Uh, CA4, I think it was. Um, they've obviously brought the passengers ashore, <coughs> although later on Qantas, they were supposed to supply their own boats, so they had their own uh, boat up there later on. But this is the one of the very early services. And uh, the passengers had to get off the boat and walk up this pretty precarious jetty. This was built by the Navy, um, which is probably okay if you're a 18 year old Motlo or whatever, <clears throat> but for uh, old ladies and so on coming off the flying boat, uh, a pretty precarious hike up. And you can see uh, this is one of the crew and this chap here with the umbrella, this is Hudson Fish, the founder and general manager of uh, Qantas. Now that jetty was destroyed just a couple of months later by Kurong, one of the Empire flying boats. Um, and, uh, the state of the facilities in Darwin was uh, was pretty average, as I said at the, the start. Um, they were using temporary mooring buoys. Uh, Kurong pulled up there during the 1938 uh, Christmas mail fiasco in, in December of 1938, uh, tied up at the buoy. Now, normally when you pulled up at the buoy in one of these aeroplanes, they would just hook a a mooring strop over the buoy, um, but it wasn't actually fastened to the buoy um, if you're only going to stay there temporarily. But if you're staying for the night, which they did in Darwin, I would also hook up a thing called a storm pennant. And you can see hanging off the very bow of the aircraft here, this cable, that's the line for the storm pennant. Now, unlike the normal mooring strop, which just slipped over the buoy, as I said, the storm pennant was actually shackled to the buoy with a U-bolt. Now, Kurong was moored up, the storm pennant was connected. While she was riding at moorings and before they took off the, well, before they were able to take off the mail, or they had taken off the passengers, uh, a thunderstorm blew up, as uh, so often happens in the tropics in the afternoon. And the high winds um, caused the, uh, and the, the state of the shackle caused the, the locking mechanism to uh, un, uh, unscrew. The shackle on the storm pennant came away. The mooring strop, the normal mooring strop broke under the, the force from the wind and Kurong was blown ashore 
into the position that we see here. So when it happened, the tide was a lot higher uh, than it is here. The tide's gone out, and that's one of the features of Northern Australia who have huge tides. So Kurong uh, landed on this jetty and smashed it up pretty badly. Um, the airplane, this is taken about a week later. You can see they've started to dismantle it. The engines have been taken off. They were able to get all the mail out uh, without it being inundated, fortunately. Uh, and you can see just on the wing here, they piled a whole stack of timber and so on onto the wing to hold the aircraft in place so that it didn't slip back into the sea and sink. Uh, and they're able to pull it apart there and eventually ship it back to the UK where it was refurbished, rebuilt, refurbished and re-entered service uh, later on during the war. <coughs> so going back to the early facilities at Darwin, so we saw Hudson Fish coming up the uh, jetty in that uh, earlier photograph and here he is here with the fag in his mouth standing in the passenger terminal at Darwin. So uh, you can imagine what a good impression of Australia uh, that gave to passengers arriving from uh, the UK when uh, their first greeting is uh, a little tin shed on the wharf at uh, Darwin. And so they're waiting for their bags to be uh, rifled through by customs and immigration and so on. So it was pretty poor and, and Hudson Fish complained pretty uh, loudly to the press and also privately to the authorities about uh, the, the lack of proper facilities in particularly in Darwin, but also at some of the other places. Uh, and a year or so later, they had built this um, passenger terminal at uh, Darwin, which was a much better thing. It had plenty of space inside for the passengers to wait uh, for customs and immigration and so on. They had a, a control office up here where the um, control officer could keep an eye on what was going on. And underneath the building here, this open space, this is where all the mail sorting took place. So there, um, <coughs> as part of the introduction of the Empire Airmail Scheme, the Department of Civil Aviation reorganised all the internal mail uh, connections as well. So uh, Guinea Airways had a service, they were given a service that ran up from Adelaide through Alice Springs to Darwin, uh, and they collected the mail or delivered the mail for the southern states, so um, uh, South Australia, uh, mail for Victoria and also mail for Tasmania went by that route. And MMA had a route that went up the west coast of Australia from Perth. So they collected all the mail for Western Australia and all, all the ports along the way and took it from Darwin that way. And mail for Queensland and New South Wales went obviously on the flying boat to Brisbane and then down to Sydney. And in Sydney, Sydney was the terminus of the route at uh, Rose Bay. At Sydney, the Commonwealth built this rather lovely little um, passenger terminal come control building. Once again, we've got a little sort of office in a balcony for the control staff to, to watch out what's going on. Uh, a jetty for landing the passengers and tying up boats and uh, waiting rooms, customs and immigration and so on. So this is rather quite a lovely building and that was there until the 1970s, which unfortunately uh, then got knocked down and it's pretty nobody thought to preserve it. Um, but right from the start, there were complaints that it was far too small and you can see it is quite small and particularly um, with the large loads of mail that had to come ashore and be sorted and so on. Um, there was really not enough room in this building. So fairly shortly afterwards, I built on some annexes on the sides or the ends of the building to make it uh, larger. Uh, in the background, you can see is uh, the hangar going up. This was the, the first uh, Qantas hangar there. This photograph's taken, uh, I think, in around early 1939. Uh, and this hangar is still under construction. So when the scheme started in 1938, there was no hangarage. So, uh, even if you could get the flying boat ashore, there was no uh, roof that you could put it under to do your maintenance. And in fact, as I mentioned uh, earlier on when the scheme started, there was no slipway east of Singapore to get the boat out of the water. One of the first things I did do at Rose Bay 
was still to slip away, but it wasn't ready till January 1939. So that was several months after the scheme started. So prior to that, uh, all the turnaround maintenance on the airplanes in Sydney, and they used to come in just as they slipped a couple of days in Singapore. They also slipped in, well, they didn't slip, they waited in Sydney for a couple of days till the next service. But that's where they would do all their routine sort of turnaround maintenance. Uh, and then for the first few months, that all had to be done on the water. So there's no way to get the aeroplane ashore. So you can imagine if you drop your spanner or something, uh, it's going to go splash and you'll never see it again. So they resorted to all sorts of interesting tricks, like tying their tools on, onto their belts with string and all that sort of stuff. And of course, if you slipped off, you also went for a drink. <clears throat> So January, late January 1939, the slipway was ready for use. And this is uh, Cameronian being for sure. Uh, and you can see British registered boat. Um, actually, uh, Arthur Baird, uh, who's the Qantas chief engineer, tells an interesting story about this event. <coughs> the original tractor that they used to pull it ashore was much smaller than this one. And they got it halfway up the slipway. And then the flying boat started to pull the tractor back into the water. So they had to quickly unhitch it and then go and find a bigger tractor to, to haul the flying boat out. Uh, this is a photograph um, from about the same time. So we've got series and just a boat ashore at Rose Bay. Uh, the hangar's still being built. So even when you could get the flying boat ashore, there was still no roof to do your maintenance under. You had to do it out in the open until <coughs> the hangar uh, was actually completed in at the end of 1939. So one other aspect of the uh, scheme that I want to talk about is uh, the remote flying boat bases. So this is um, map shows you the route. So from Kopang and uh, Timor to Darwin, the route then went from Darwin across to Groot Island in the Gulf of Carpentaria. <coughs> down to Karumba, which is also on the Gulf, on the eastern side, and then across uh, Cape York, or the bottom of Cape York Peninsula, to Townsville, down to Gladstone, Brisbane, and Sydney. So this was a two-day affair from Darwin. So the first day was Darwin, Groot, Karumba, Townsville, overnight in Townsville, and then the next day, Townsville, Gladstone, Brisbane, Sydney. Um, so pretty much a full day's flying to do those sections. You can see they're all well, they're not all 500 miles, but the, the largest, longest sections, 518 miles on the Timor Sea. And that was about as far as you could fly the Empire flying boat with a full load. Or at least in that period. I did improve uh, later on. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Karumba flying boat base. So these bases at Groot Island, uh, I've got a presentation I can do about that uh, as a separate thing if anyone's interested. But... Um, uh, these two bases here, particularly, they were very, very remote locations back in the late 1930s. Uh, um, there was nobody on Groot Island at the flying boat base other than the people who lived there. And at Karumba, there were only, uh, you know, a very small number of people, like, you know, five or six people in Karumba at, at that time. So, <coughs> very isolated. Communications were very poor. In fact, in both of these places, uh, you had to either wait for the monthly supply ship to come round, or the flying boat was the only other means of getting in and out of the place pretty much. Um, and uh, communications was by radio using the air radio network. So they also doubled as the, the post office telegraph for those two uh, locations. So at Karumba, which we're going to consider in a bit more detail, um, the actual alighting area for the flying boats was on the Norman River. So this is uh, the location of Karumba and the Eastern Gulf. Um, so we've got the Norman River here that runs inland to Normanton. So you don't think that's far, but it was quite a long trip by boat. And um, there was a road, but it uh, was impassable for a fair bit of the year. Um, so Karumba was actually quite uh, cut off from any other, uh, well, certainly uh, civilization. <clears throat> the flying boats could, they had two runs, they could alight on the mouth uh, reach of the river, or this uh, first reach here that ran past the flying boat base, which was in this area here. 
So this is what the flying boat base looked like from the where the moorings were, so looking across the river. Uh, and the buildings we've got here on this side on the left, we've got uh, a barracks building. This was the accommodation for the people who live there, the people in the flying boat base. Uh, this other major building is the control building. So that's where all the technical work went on. The meteorologist had his office there. The air radio people worked out of that building. <coughs> Pardon me. And the OIC of the base had his office and his living quarters, in fact, in there as well. Uh, in the middle here, this little looks like a little hut, but it's actually a fairly sizable building. Um, I should say these bases, when they were built, uh, they were kind of the latest word in tropical living standards for the day. So they're pretty primitive by our standards today, but in, in their day they were pretty advanced. And one of the advanced features was they had a refrigeration plant. Now, there weren't many refrigeration plants around. People didn't have fridges in their houses back in, in the late 30s. Um, but this base had a refrigeration plant. They had a, uh, it was divided into two sections. They had a cool, um, cool store and a, a freezer plant as well, so they could keep uh, frozen food. And when you realise that uh, basically they de depended on the monthly uh, supply ship, um, you can understand why they needed a uh, cool store and a, a freezer. Um, sorry. The other thing I just want to point out is uh, this here, that's the end of the jetty. We're looking at it end on. So we'll, we'll see a photograph of that again in a sec. So this is the, uh, the base from behind those buildings. Here's the control building and the barracks here. And these are the masts for the HF uh, radio uh, receivers here. And you can see that our chap here is shinnying up the, the mast to, to do something. Um, I'm pretty sure he hasn't got a helmet and a safety harness on. Um, and he's probably wearing thongs as well. So uh, there you go. Uh, these tents here, these were the tents for the people building the base. So this dates the photograph to uh, mid July, August 1938. Uh, now, this is a view of the barracks building, so the accommodation. And you can see the windows here are these uh, louver slats. Now, there was no glass in these windows. Uh, they just had the slats. And in the early part of, uh, early part of the base's life, they didn't have any flywire screens on the windows either uh, because the uh, Department of uh, the Interior who were, were building, the, the they're actually responsible for the design and construction of the buildings. Um, they were too cheap to uh, supply flywire. And then there was a big bureaucratic argument uh, over a, a period after the, the base was occupied um, where the staff were saying well you know the, the place is full of insects and we need flywire on the on the on the windscreen so uh, on the windows so they did eventually get them now there's no air conditioning so these louver slats were quite important to allow air to flow through the building now the building itself it was divided into four sections basically so on each end and these wings here were the sleeping areas. So the bases had a very hierarchical structure. So um, <clears throat> the staff of the base, you had the, the man in charge, the officer in charge, and then they had the officers who were the, the more highly qualified members of staff. So the air radio operators, the meteorologists and so on. And then you had the men and the men were the boat hands, the coxswains, the stewards, the um, the engineer they had to keep all the, the power plant running and so on. So the officers got their own room, <coughs> but the men slept in a dormitory. Um, so once again, oh, and I should say there were no wives. So if you got posted up in the early days to these places, um, you went without your family. Um, and it was a two year posting as well. So you can imagine how much fun that would have been living in a, a dormitory with seven or eight or maybe more, 10 other blokes for two years. Anyway, there you go. That's what they had to do in those days. Uh, at the back of the building, this area here was the kitchen. And in the central area of the building was a dining and lounge area. Uh, so 
<clears throat> once again, in the dining area, they had a table for the officers and a table for the men. The officers had a tablecloth normally. The men didn't get a tablecloth, except on special occasions. <coughs> uh, and they also had a lounge area where they could sit and read or whatever. They had a radio. And Qantas actually paid for a billiard table to be uh, sent up to each of these bases. So they had something to do. Um, here's the flying boat, the lighting on the Norman River and the jetty I mentioned. And you can see from the size of the figures on the end of it, how big the tidal range on that river was. <coughs> um, quite a massive uh, ebb and flow of the tide. So the flying boats would alight on the river out the front of the base, tie up on the far side where the moorings were, and then the, they would go out and greet the flying boat. <coughs> um, Shell had a launch there that the, their um, setup was just up the river from the flying boat base. They built a huge fuel tank, uh, fuel farm, so they could refuel these uh, aeroplanes because once again, the supply ship with fuel only came uh, once or twice a year. And uh, their boat uh, would go out, plug into the flying boat and pump it full of fuel. And these people here are uh, onlookers. These are some of the people on the base, I think. Um, normally, uh, or often what they would do is uh, they'd take the control launch alongside and take the passengers off the aeroplane <coughs> while it was being refuelled and they'd run them up and down the river just for something to do. Because otherwise they normally didn't come ashore uh, at Grid Island or at um, Karumba. This is going back into the, uh, the barracks again. This is the dining area. Uh, and it's been doled up especially for Empire Day 1939 uh, with a big welcome to Karumba sign. I don't know who they were welcoming, welcoming exactly. Um, occasionally, if the aeroplane broke down, they would have to accommodate the passengers in these buses. And I've got some accounts where they had to set up camp stretches around the veranda of the building for the passengers to sleep on and things like that. But normally, they, they didn't have any passengers there. I do love the um, the table legs sitting in these tins. I think it's probably to stop ants crawling up the uh, the legs of the table. Some of the older people here will remember that. I remember my grandmother doing it. So those flying boat bases, uh, they had a, quite a large staff. They had 23, 24, 25 people, depending on you know, various times, um, with a, a variety of occupations. Um, so this is the staff of Karumba. This chap here is uh, Dudley Turner. He was the officer in charge. And <coughs> as well as the OIC or the control officer, as, as he was known, he had a couple of air radio officers, air radio operators, I should say, <coughs> uh, a meteorologist, two coxswains to run the boats, two boat hands to man the, the boats. Um, you had a steward, uh, an engineer, uh, a labourer or a couple of labourers to do all the odd jobs around the base to, you know, the painting and the weeding and whatever else they needed doing. So it was quite a huge uh, operation. And when you think about it, all of those people who were there, and we're not even talking about the, the shell people who they had their own crew of people to refill the aeroplanes, they were all there to run six movements a week. So not even one movement a day. So huge investment to run this service. So this is the air radio office in Karumba. This is Johnny Walker. He was uh, one of the air radio operators there. This gadget on the desk is a direction finder. So they had a, a direction finder. The flying boats, the Empire flying boats also had an onboard uh, radio direction finder. So it was your main navigation aid in those days. And here on uh, Johnny's left are the HF radio receivers. This is Pat Allender, he was a meteorologist and he's uh, taking a sighting on the weather balloon. And there was never any shortage of uh, maintenance jobs to be done. And these are the chaps here, this is the auxiliary launch. So they had two, two launches, a control launch and an auxiliary launch. Uh, and this is the auxiliary and it uh, looks like they're debarnacling it and repainting it or whatever they're up to. Uh, so in those, for those jobs, everybody had to uh, lend a hand. This is uh, Johnny Walker here again. Monthly fly ship. This is the uh, SS Wandana that used to come around uh, every month with uh, dry stores and so on. 
Now, the um, people at, uh, at Karumba, there was a meatworks that operated seasonally uh, just down next to the base. Um, and they tried to buy fresh meat from the meatworks, but they wouldn't sell them any. So they ended up setting up a, an arrangement with one of the local cattle uh, farmers where he would sell them a, a cow or a bull and they would butcher it themselves. Um, because they had a cool store, they could keep, keep it. Um, and what they would do is they would divide it in half, they'd keep half of it for themselves, and the other half, Qantas would freight up to Groot Island for them for nothing, and they sold it to the mess up in Groot Island. So the people in Groot Island had fresh beef <clears throat> as well. And what they'd chuck in Groot Island was enough to pay for the whole beast. So the people in Karumba ate for free. <coughs> as well as that, to supplement their um, their uh, rations, um, they did their own farming. So this is the uh, the base guys building a chook run to keep uh, fresh chickens or keep live chickens at uh, Karumba. Uh, they also tried uh, growing uh, crops of various things as well, but uh, that didn't, that didn't really work out, um, and uh, particularly not at uh, Grooted Island because the soil was very sandy. They couldn't get anything to grow. Uh, but basically, if you wanted to be eating decent food, you had to be self-sufficient was the, the idea. So it seems incredible to us these days. Now, unlike the people at Brood Island, they couldn't even leave the base area, but for reasons which I won't bore you with. Uh, at Karumba, they could actually get off the base uh, from time to time. And uh, one of their favourite things to do was to have hunting parties. So they had a, an old uh, truck and um, they used to go off and shoot whatever animals they could find. So these are the, this is one of the, the um, hunting parties. This guy here is Bob Phillips. He was the chief uh, coxswain for the uh, boats. And speaking of boats, this is uh, Johnny Walker here and Danny Prentice. He was a boat hand or, uh, no, sorry, he was the other coxswain at Karumba, and they're out for a, a spin on the, the river, just for something to do. Now, there's plenty of wildlife around Karumba. <coughs> um, as this uh, photograph shows, this chap, his, uh, his name was T.W. Bridger. He was an engineer. Uh, he was in charge of building the base. And um, uh, he looks like he's found a little friend uh, while they were at it. So you had to watch out. Um, uh, if you were anywhere near the water at uh, Karumba and at Groot Island, because uh, uh, crocs were around. But the fishing in the river was also pretty good. And this was a um, uh, cod uh, fished out of the, the Norman River. So pretty impressive size uh, fish. Now, unlike Groot Island, there were actually some females in the Karumba area. The uh, local marine pilot had a house up at the mouth of the river and he had three daughters, these three ladies. And uh, as you can imagine, they were pretty popular, even though they're quite young. Um, and they used to come down and they would collect all the washing uh, from the people at the uh, base and go away and do that for uh, a few coins. And you can see that's what they've got wrapped up in those parcels there. This uh, young lady in the middle here, she actually ended up marrying one of the uh, the uh, base uh, staff. In fact, there was uh, Danny Prentice, that uh, chap we saw in the other photograph. And uh, just to wrap up on uh, Karumba, this is a photograph. This is Dudley Turner, if you remember, I said he was the OIC, Johnny Walker here. Uh, they're in Turner's quarters in the control building. So because he was the officer in charge, um, it wasn't uh, considered right that he mingled with the, the troops. So he had his living quarters in, in the control building, whereas everybody else lived in the barracks building. Uh, so Walker's obviously gone over to uh, smoke his cigarette or something after dinner with uh, Dudley Turner. He said that they used to often get together and uh, talk about one thing or another. Um, so uh, a pretty basic lifestyle, as you can imagine. Some of that seems quite unbelievable, judged by today's standards, but uh, it was what it was and probably pretty typical for a lot of people. Uh, they had much harder lives than we're used to these days. So I'm just going to wrap up 
um, now with uh, some of the advertising that Qantas put out for the Empire Airmail scheme, I didn't actually talk about the end of the scheme. So we've talked about a lot of the, the start of the Empire Airmail scheme and you can imagine all the effort and the money that went into setting this up. And it got underway in August of 1938. And by September of 1939, just over a year later, the Second World War started. And the first thing that they did at the start of the Second World War was cancel the Empire Airmail scheme. Not the flying boats, the flying boats continued, but the uh, mail price reverted to its old uh, price for the surcharge. The point being to try and discourage the sending of mail so that they could repurpose the flying boats for military tasks because they needed to, to take them off, particularly Australia. Our um, Air Force was had basically no useful operational aeroplanes. So one of the first things they did was they collared two of the Empire flying boats that were in Sydney at the start of the war. Um, and the same thing happened in the UK. So with less aeroplanes, they had to obviously reduce the loads that were being carried. So they put the surcharge back on the mail. So the Empire Airmail Scheme, as I said earlier at the start, it was a far-reaching, far-sighted scheme. It had lived up to its um, promise. But because of the war situation, uh, it only lasted for a year. Um, but it was magnificent in that time. And uh, Qantas certainly played that up in the advertising that they uh, did for the service. And these, I love these old ads. I think they're just uh, gorgeous. So far and yet so near. There are no distant places anymore. London is only 10 and a half days away from Sydney. Can you imagine it? It's only 24 hours away now. <clears throat> so there we go. It was all about luxury transport for more good looking people. But uh, as I said, um, the real purpose was shifting the mail. So thank you very much for listening and I'm um, more than happy to answer any questions. All right. So can you take that down so we can have the gallery view? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> How's that? Yep. <coughs> Back in business. Okay, questions to Phil. Phil, Dave Prosser. Um, a couple of quick ones for you. Um, while the uh, Empire flying boats, the S-23, were obviously uh, predominant on the route there, um, I've noticed that the, the Boeing 314 Clippers have got little or no publicity, although there were a dozen of those uh, in service uh, prior to World War II. And yet they appear to be a bigger boat, take uh, more uh, passengers on board, and uh, yet uh, at the same time, in our neck of the woods anyway, Australia and perhaps England, uh, got remarkably less uh, publicity. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, well, the Boeing 314 was operated by Pan Am uh, across the Pacific um, to the Philippines in Hong Kong and then later on down to Auckland. And during 1941 or 4041, um, the Empire Flying Boat Service actually connected with the Pan Am Trans-Pacific Service for a fairly brief period. The Second World War spread to the Pacific. Uh, so they were never, well, there was only one that ever came to Australia, and that's a story in itself, but um, they're really never seen in Australia. Um, but they certainly connected with the, um, the Empire Flying Boat Service to the Empire Air Route. And the, the, the Clippers, and of course the, um, the short uh, 23s were all in that four engine um, uh, pre war airliner type aircraft that were developing at that time. There were a number of others also, both flying boats and um, uh, land planes, but um, it was certainly an era to be uh, well assured to be able to be transported around the world, typically VFR, a little bit of IFR, I suspect, but it must have been quite a time to have been a, um, a well, well heeled uh, passenger in those days. I think it would have been a wonderful trip. That's that's for sure. Yeah, but you know the the airfare from Australia to England was about a year's pay for an ordinary person, so it certainly wasn't cheap. I understand. 
Uh, John, I can see your hand waving. Uh, I uh, sometimes think when I'm uh, attending, thank you, uh, thank you to the AHSA for uh, inviting. I'm John Tribe, I'm with the uh, uh, Bill Vabre's mob. But um, I find we often feel like saying, are we going to be examined on this? But this is one uh, talk that I've attended that I would be happy to be examined on. It's been fantastic. Thanks, Phil. Question is, uh, I noticed there's no navigator or engineer, and it's a general question, but those aircraft, did they not carry those people? Uh, good question, John, and thanks for your kind words. Um, no, they didn't. So the pilots had uh, navigator's licenses as well. They were required to have a second class uh, navigator's license, or well, the captain was anyway. Um, and uh, there was no need for a flight engineer on the S23. The S25, which we know better as the Sunderland or the Hyde Sandringham flying boat, that did have a flight engineer, but not the, um, not the S23s. Uh, thanks. Uh, the other question was, there's no accidents. Were there any, uh, not delays, but were there any actual accidents <laughs> apart from uh, uh, mooring accidents and things like that while the aircraft was moored? Uh, yeah, I haven't talked much about them. Obviously, we did look at the Coorong. Um, but yes, uh, about half of the Empire flying boats uh, were destroyed in accidents, which is a pretty high accident rate, although it was pretty par for the course, actually. Uh, for aircraft of that era. Um, but the Empire flying boats had a particular weakness in their, um, the, the hull bottom, the planing bottom, and they are quite susceptible to getting hulled. And one of the disadvantages that they quickly came to appreciate of a flying boat is that with a land plane, if you ding it, generally, uh, if it's not too bad, you can jack the thing up and rebuild it. With a flying boat, if you put a hole in it, it goes down to the bottom of the sea and that's a much more tricky job to haul it up and, and try and rebuild it if you can, if it's not all corroded out by the seawater. So that was one of the big disadvantages of the, the flying boat. So land accidents can be minor and still you know, end up with not that much damage, um, but any accident at all in a flying boat tends to be a huge one. <coughs> The, uh, the aircraft go for engine reliability, Phil. Sorry, what was that, Dave? How did the, uh, the aircraft go for uh, reliability of the engines? Uh, well, <clears throat> in the early days, not all that well. Um, the Pegasus engines were quite unreliable early on. Um, they did later on, uh, after a few years, they sort of ironed out most of the problems. Um, but aero engines of all stripes in those days were quite unreliable too. You've got, you've got to remember that. Even uh, the American engines that we think of as being super dependable in the early days weren't as dependable as they became later on. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the Pegasus were quite unreliable early. Uh, fully feathering props on them? No feathering props at all, Dave. So that was a bit of a problem because if you had an engine fighter, you had a huge amount of drag from the... Um, the uh, propeller. I understand. Uh, yeah. So the, the Teal had two S30 boats, which were similar but not the same as the S23s, um, and they fitted feathering props to those aeroplanes, but they were the only ones that ever did get feathering props. Tom, Phil, did anyone, did any aircraft ever have to land out at sea? Were they ever forced to land on the ocean, sort of thing? Um, <laughs> that's a good question, Prong, because one of the rationales for the use of the flying boats, for the, the why they were favoured, was that this concept that um, in an emergency, the uh, aircraft would be able to alight on any stretch of water out at sea or whatever. And, um, in practice, that almost never happened. Uh, there was one instance of one of the flying boats um, was being used between Bermuda and New York, uh, and they did put it down on the open ocean, but it sank. Um, 
uh, and there was the only other instance that I'm aware of where that occurred was um, actually uh, uh, Russell Tapp, who was a Qantas pilot, was uh, flying into Batavia in bad weather and couldn't find the harbour. And he ended up putting the flying boat down on a river um, just down the coast from uh, Batavia. Uh, and that's the only instance really where I can that I've ever found of where somebody successfully did a, a forced landing in one of these boats. Uh -huh. Phil, Phil, could I just uh, uh, chime in, uh, apart from uh, thanking you for the exercise tonight, I think it's been marvellous. My interest has been pretty much in Queensland's airfields and, and lighting grounds in terms of flying boats. Lake Lucy is what I would imagine a, an interesting, if not attractive, bit of water between Corumba and Townsville. Uh, to your knowledge, has there ever been an incident of a, a, a flying boat landing on Lake Lucy? Well, not a civil one, no. <clears throat> uh, well, not, a, not an Empire flying boat. Um, the RAAF may well have used it. Um, I'm pretty sure the RAAF uh, flying boat based directory lists Lake Lucy as a um, as a, a lighting area, but I'm not quite sure of, of what sort of standard off the top of my head. Bill Dave Frost again. Uh, Roland. Investment, um, in the whole thing was actually uh, part of the recognition that land planes would ultimately be far more uh, economical to operate over that period. Sorry, um, Roland, I, I missed the start of the question. It was more or less about uh, how much do you think the underinvestment, which was fairly obvious, at least at the Australian end, um, was part to do with the realisation that uh, land planes were going to be far more economical and quicker uh, in the near future. Kurt Tank gave a lecture in England in 1938 and uh, he was using the uh, Fockel Condor, uh, which he'd uh, just about got off the drawing board at that stage. And uh, they were planning regular Atlantic flights with those. Um, yeah, well, that's a good question. Uh, Edgar Johnston uh, was very forceful in arguing that Australia should operate its own fleet of land planes between Singapore and Australia because um, his, his view was that the flying boats were more trouble than they were worth and not as efficient. Um, so there were certainly people who had that view. Um, for a number of reasons, they decided to go with the flying boats, but even Imperial Airways fairly quickly abandoned that themselves and um, they contracted Armstrong Whitworth to build the, um, uh, the ensign airline as big four engine land planes and they were used to supplement the flying boats uh, although they were very delayed coming online for various reasons. Um, so yeah I think it, it seemed like a good idea at the time to some people. Uh, there were people who had the foresight and knowledge to realise that they were a bit of a dead end um, but so they, they came in anyway. Um, and it turned out that uh, they were a diversion from the mainstream of aviation. I don't think anybody realised the effect of 30-foot tides at the top end of Australia and what effect that would have on their operations. Uh, I think they realised. Uh, <laughs> I don't think the people who, the politicians who were behind uh, the decision really uh, wanted to listen to that, though. Um, Ronald Webster, I think you had your hand up at one stage. He's still muted. Push the space bar on your keyboard. Hold it down. That's it. Hi. Okay. Um, at Crumba, there are slipways there, but they they would be probably post the post the. Um, Empire boats, would they? Yeah, the, the Corumba slipways were built during the war by the RAAF. Right, and I come from Townsville originally, and 
there was still when I was growing up, they had big, very big red buoys in the harbour where they used to moor the boats. I'm not sure whether they could have been they could have been later too, but uh, probably wartime as well. Mm -hmm. Townsville had a, a bit of an odd setup. They had a sort of a harbour within a harbour um, enclosed by a breakwater, and the flying boats were more in in there. But it was very shallow water. Okay. Oh, thanks, sir. Thank you. That's a... Well, um, Graham Aspinall's had his hand up for a while, and then I'd like to ask yep. a question as well. Okay. I can't see everybody's uh, hands because I can only see one page at a time. So if I, I don't see you, um, apologies, but Graham Aspinall. Okay. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks, Phil. Yeah, thanks for a great presentation uh, again. Um, just a question, uh, your research into the uh, short empire boats, I guess it's touched on worldwide operations. So just wondering whether you had any, uh, done any research on the uh, composite boat. Uh, I think there was an experiment done with the Mayer composite where they had like a, a float plane attached to the, uh, the top of a, uh, a short empire. I think it was experimental um, for mail services too. Have you touched on uh, any research in that area, Phil? Um, look, I know about it. Uh, obviously, but um, I haven't really studied it in a huge amount of detail. Um, was there a specific thing you wanted to know? No, I just I had had heard about and read about it a long time ago. Just wondering whether whether you had touched on any uh, research in that area, and uh, I was just curious to see how successful or otherwise it was. I know it was only an experiment. I think it was to extend the range of. Uh, uh, an aircraft carrying mail, and I think it was a quite unique proposal to put up. I think it was a twin engine or a four engine uh, float plane on top of a short flying boat, and they'd fly a certain distance, and then the the aircraft on top would disconnect and fly the the, the remainder of the route to deliver mail or whatever. So yeah, just just curious to know whether you might have even touched in that area. Um, look, the big problem technically for Imperial Airways at that period was flying the Atlantic, how were they going to connect Canada into the uh, British Empire by air? Um, and aircraft with the range to fly the Atlantic just didn't exist. So they experimented with a, with a number of schemes to try and uh, develop long range aircraft that would be capable of regularly flying the Atlantic. And that was the short Mayo composite was one of those schemes. Um, the idea was that the big flying boat would get the little flying boat airborne um, and then it would uncouple and the little flying boat would, so it could get airborne at a heavier weight than it would able be able to get airborne at um, if it was taking off from the water on its own was the idea. Um, <coughs> but but made much, uh, pretty much of a dead end. The other thing Imperial Airways experimented with was air-to-air -air refuelling. They did quite a bit of work on that and actually used it operationally on a couple of flights across the Atlantic um, where they had a, um, a tanker aircraft. So uh, you might have heard of the company Flight Refueling Limited that still exists today. Um, uh, the, <coughs> that was uh, Sir Alan Cobham's uh, company and they started off doing this work for uh, Imperial Airways. So they, they had a, a tanker aircraft and the flying boat um, had a means of uh, hooking up the refueling cable and then winching it into the back of the aircraft and they could top up the tank. So once again, the aircraft could get airborne at a lighter weight and then once it's airborne, they could fill it up to a heavier weight with uh, fuel and then it would have enough range to cross the Atlantic. So that's what, what that was all about. Thanks, Phil. The short Mayo combination, the late Don Bennett still holds the world record for an unrefueled flight uh, distance from Scotland to South Africa in the short, uh, uh, the, the smaller aircraft which would uh, disconnect and fly along the route. That would have to be a class record work because um, there have been longer flights I think since then. Yes, I know in class, I mean class of being flying boats. Yeah, right. Phil, uh, Peter Dunn here uh, in Brisbane. Okay. Um, um, maybe another another great presentation. Um, and as always, you've got some excellent photos uh, in your presentations. They're always incredible photos.
Um, I too grew up in Townsville, um, like one of our pre previous um, uh, questioners. Um, I was interested, were there terminal facilities in Townsville uh, or did they just stay on the boat and re refuel? Uh, good question, Poto. Uh, Townsville was a night stop, so they had to have terminal facilities, but there weren't that many people actually joining and leaving the flight at terminal. Yep. At, at Townsville, it wasn't really a, a big uh, uh, source of passengers. Um, so they did build a building there, but it, call it a passenger terminal, but it was really a, it was like a, a one room house. It was as big as my lounge room, maybe a bit bigger. Was it uh, sort of near the end of the breakwater, was it? Uh, oh, no, no, it was uh, well back down. Um, I've got the actual address for it, and I know where it is, but it was down the, the croak a bit. Okay, I'll, I'll communicate by email. Yeah. Um, I don't know where it was, it'd be hard to describe because I don't know towns for that well. Yep, okay. Um, <coughs> I noticed also you've colorized quite a few color, oh, black and white photos. Uh, what software do you use for that? Uh, Photoshop. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. I so think De Dion's, Dion's your next question. Oh, yeah, Dion, I saw you had a question. Hey, how are you? Um, just a quick one. Um, in Darwin, I, I didn't quite catch where the Darwin terminal was for the Qantas flying boats there. I, I wasn't aware that there was one, so a bit of ignorance on my part, but I'm just wondering if you could tell us where it was located. Yep. Um, uh, once again, I could show you on a map. But it's a bit mm. hard to describe. Uh, mm. If you know uh, where the oil tanks were in Darwin, mm -hmm. well, it was right there. Right, oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. One uh, quick, thank la you. quick last one. Uh, I'm gone now. Bill. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Lester Brain, was he Brain of Brain and Brown? Mm. No. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> See you, John. Well, I, I never seem to be amazed at the amount of information you have collected on the uh, Empire Airmail scheme. I've been to several of your presentations and there's not much to repeat. And each time you have got the whole thing sort of encapsulated from a totally different angle. Uh, tonight was another example of it. Most enjoyable, great evening and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>